Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, good afternoon to you. I'm at Srinagar, so I'm I'm dressed like this. <laughs> thanks, thanks for you joining. Almost almost zero degree outside. So yeah, yeah. good. Uh, I'm happy to connect and then I have to upload also no? uh carry entire uh, screen. Abhinay, Abhinay, are you here? Hello. Yeah, Vina is joined. Whether the recording has started, Aditya? Recording is already started. And uh, live streaming. Abhinay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining with us. It's a pleasure, sir. Good afternoon. Aditya, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. So, uh, live stream has started already? Yes, 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 it is started. Okay, so I think without uh, making any delay, within two minutes we will start shortly and will uh, be ready. We will start shortly at 2.35. Okay, sir. Dr. Rudra has joined. Uh, whether Dr. Rudra sir has joined? So let Rudra sir. No issue, he will join. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we shall start. So, Guru, you may start, and Dr. Nutrasar will join. He has just message. Okay, sir. A very good afternoon to all the distinguished guests, delegates, speakers, and participants. My name is Bulu Bashak, faculty of South Asian Institute for Advanced Research and Development. Today, on behalf of SIAT and National Institute of Disaster Management, which is under the Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, I welcome you all to the second day of three days capacity building program on coastal disaster risk reduction and resilience. It is a great opportunity and honor for me to be a part of this wonderful program where panelists from different sphere of life will be participating with their distinguished experiences. So let's not waste time on introduction because participants are eagerly waiting to listen our panelists. So now I would like to request our chairman, Sir Dr. Bishwajit Roy Choudhury for the welcome address. It's over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Bulu, and thank you, uh, the honorable dignitaries, those who have joined, and thank you, Arindam, our team, and especially our today's resource person, Dr. V, Major General V.K. Nayak, sir, uh, Dr. Kallan Rudra, and Kumar Abhinay, 
for joining with us and for uh, being enlightening with us regarding the focal theme of this three days capacity building even program that is uh, that is the coastal disaster resilience and also i am convey my sincere thanks to the authorities of national institute of disaster management especially shuria pradas sir professor shuria pradas sir and uh, his team for being with us regarding this three days event on coast, the coastal disaster risk related so yesterday we have a very wonderful we had a very wonderful session regarding the uh, focal theme on this event and several resource persons from jadavpur university and from odisha space application center as an even ministry of environment uh, sorry ministry of earth science has joined so and they are enlightening us and today the resource persons those who have joined from the different angles they will share some different angles and hope this today's event will definitely enlighten us not only enlighten us but also through this event we can also get some another viewpoint and on the on that particular issue so with this without wasting any time i would like to uh, request our uh, academic director affair director academic affair sorry sri arindam ray to say few words and also precise the note of yesterday's event arindam over to you thank you chairman sir uh, first of all the welcome this is good afternoon to all of you and welcome all of you in the three days coast uh, capacity building program the coastal disaster risk reduction and resilience in india organized by siert and nitm the two uh, yesterday's uh, session was really very enriched and really wonderful Professor Shugato Hazra, the professor from Chalpur University, he delivered his uh, lecture on disaster risk reduction through sustainable development in Sundarban, and he focused the uh, tsunami areas, hazard, and disaster management over that particular area. He also explained that development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. and he specially emphasized over the sustainable development he also discussed about the different types of hazard like biological hazard geological hazard hydrometeorological hazard and also he focused over the sendai framework after that our next lecture was uh, by dr xk dash orinda please unmute Yes, Doctor. Next, uh, uh, sorry for the technical glitch. The next uh, uh, panelist was uh, Professor Doctor S K Das, the senior scientist in C C R Ministry of Art Science, Government of India. He delivered his lecture on a glimpse of coastal hazard and vulnerability research in India. He illustrated the coastal processes, coastal hazard, coastal vulnerability, sea water quality monitoring, and he mentioned. the 50 location along the indian coast and he explained the effects of microplastic in the coastal waters and sediments he showed the shoreline mapping and in the coastal protection our last speaker uh, was um, rr thakur uh, odisha and senior uh, scientist from the odisha space application center on the coastal application and he focused over the coastal application using the geospatial technology he explained the art terrain feature he wanted to focus over the coastal regulation zone for hazard and disaster risk management he emphasized over on crz land along with the tidally influenced water bodies he also showed the probable high tide line of coastal land in hazard mapping so now this is the right time for the today's session and we are looking forward over to you uh, ms polu thank you sir now i would like to welcome our honorable guest major general dr v k nayak sir former senior consultant in dme government of india major general dr v k nayak completed his phd in disaster management during mr nayak's military career of about 38 years he was awarded the kirti chakra and the avsm award he has served as an advisor in the cabinet secretariat of government of india 
Mr. Nayak was a senior consultant at the National Institute of Disaster Management as well as a member of the advisory committee on human included uh, disasters in Bihar State Disaster Management Authority. Mr. Nayak served as a senior consultant at the NDMA for five years and has been involved in planning, coordination, and conducted various capacity building initiatives at national and international level. Now I uh, want to give the floor to Dr. Nayak sir. It's over to you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Bulu. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rai Chaudhary. Am I audible, please? Am I audible? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. You were uh, audible. OK, OK. Thank you so much for <clears throat> Uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be uh, be part of this SIARD's capacity building initiative on disaster management. And I'm thankful to the SIARD as well as, as, well as the National Institute of Disaster Management with whom I have had long association for uh, giving this opportunity to me uh, to be sharing uh, my views on disaster mitigation in particular. Uh, and uh, what are the concepts and uh, how, how it is being practiced in the country if we say that disaster mitigation is already happening uh, what are the tools how does it happen on ground uh, that will be my focus of the talk and uh, uh, as i gathered just now yesterday's very very learned speakers focused on uh, coastal zones the coastal zone regulations the the uh, the disaster risk reduction in coastal areas the uh, whole thing is should be seen as an integrated one because disaster management itself is a, a multidisciplinary subject. So uh, you will at times see a domain within a domain or a set within a subset, so many subsets of disaster management within one activity, and they're not exclusive of each other. So uh, without uh, uh, continuing with the generalities now, we will uh, focus particularly on disaster mitigation and uh, we'll see uh, as to how it is done on ground uh, in the in the country through various policies and plans and various schemes uh, will can you see my screen now no can my screen be seen now no sir oh, i have to sir first you have to share your screen my screen is on and uh, yeah the screen is on now sir go to present now option but i am okay I have come to the site where I can see all of you. And uh, here I have a, I have already said, share the screen. How do I share entire screen? But my screen as of now. If Sir, you can... just do one thing. First, open your uh, PPT on the desktop. Now it's open. And now you go to the share screen mode, present now mode. And there, from there, you just have to go a window. And hope you may see all of you. No, I have come here now. Very oh, good. Share, share. Okay. I have come to the. Now it is saying sharing. You yes, are. It's coming. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there's an option of stop sharing and there's an option of sharing. So am I screen yeah, now? You just go to your PowerPoint presentations. Yeah. yeah fine. Uh, can you see it now? Yes, yes. Oh. Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. So kindly, uh, you can interrupt me if it's not happening and uh, we'll do the needful. So 
my uh, brief will be to give an overview of disaster mitigation, uh, <clears throat> the conceptual issues and the practices, and we will talk of coastal reasons as and when it becomes relevant. Now, this is a very standard and a basic textbook model of how disaster man management is, is done. So, and we will see how, where does the mitigation fit into the complete disaster management scenario. As you can see, uh, once a disaster strikes, whatever be the type of disaster, it could be earthquake, it could be a tsunami, uh, coastal uh, uh, cyclone, uh, then response, um, assistance, reconstruction, rehabilitation, followed by you know, certain activities will, which will fall under the um, category of preventing a disaster, whereas, whereas it is not possible to uh, prevent all disasters disasters but we can prepare for disasters and then mitigation and uh, then preparedness these are not watertight compartments but this will all happen simultaneously and once you are prepared for a up to a particular degree you continue with preparations and uh, hoping against hopes that when the disaster strikes uh, you do you perform better than what you did last time so everything else remaining constant if in a particular disaster you have lesser loss of lives and lesser loss of pro properties. It means the whole system, the whole nation, the whole system of governance, it may be district level, state level. Uh, it has been doing a good disaster management uh, practice. So uh, this mitigation comes into the second half of the disaster management cycle. And just before the disaster occurs, you take all measures to mitigate it and be prepared. Uh, now, what is disaster mitigation? These are all activities which we have to do for reducing the impact of a natural or man-made disaster on a nation or community. So when the pandemic struck us, if we had very robust, very robust uh, medical uh, setup, we, we indeed had a robust medical setup, but our orientation was uh, not towards a pandemic like this. It took us by surprise, but we very quickly got to our feet and that did a lot of things to mitigate the uh, impact of the pandemic. So all the activities done for reducing the impact. Now, this impact of disasters, what is it? Any disaster uh, impact is more or less common. Loss of lives, loss of livelihoods. Uh, now see, saving lives and saving livelihoods has got a different connotation. You can save lives, but unless you create livelihoods, you're not mitigating a disaster, impact of a disaster and uh, damage and destruction all around to property, infrastructure, crops, and biological disasters, there won't be damage and destruction to property. But a biological disaster will lead to uh, loss of livelihoods, like you've seen, which is happening in uh, the pandemic per se. The size itself has affected our economy, resulted into livelihood, livelihoods going. We saw the whole migrant population from our metros uh, like Mumbai going back to villages, it was, it was an example of uh, loss of livelihoods and the terrible impact of disaster. And uh, there could be short-term and long-term impacts. Now, take your mind to present ongoing COVID. It had short-term impacts and it will have long-term impacts. Look at, look at the whole generation of young children, uh, the, the, the way they have been educated for the last two years. Now, they still need to be studied. What is the long-term impact? And similarly, they may have health issues, they may have mental health issues. So all this is linked in disaster uh, risk mitigation. Now, it is important to understand that while it may be possible to prevent some disaster effects, others will obviously be persistent. Now, here is a photograph uh, telling you that uh, there is water all around a village. Uh, possibly lives have been uh, saved loss of life is preventable and that has been done but there will be persisting effect of disease loss of livelihood availability of loss of shelter some houses may get damaged it will make time to create those houses again drinking water medicines these are all persisting effects which will carry on after disaster has struck
and conceptually uh, certain mitigation measures can moderate or reduce the disaster effects like covid appropriate behavior you saw you um, you we are hoping against hope and it actually has helped, helped us in long run that the basics of mitigating the covid impact the basic mitigation measure is covid appropriate behavior and this is what uh, has to be kept in mind it is not only structures it is not only money it is not the big plans but the very basic things at the individual level or even at the community level will mitigate the impact of a disaster look at the um, scenario of floods where uh, where uh, a lot of villages do get affected the problem of drinking water and there is a problem of disease after after a flood that is um, more often than not gastro gastro diseases because of uh, they don't get clean water so simple training of of housewives the poor people the villagers are uh, knowing how to uh, how to survive this situation by using some uh, tablets which are distributed by the health agencies or by boiling water where possible they can mitigate the impact of the uh, disaster now how this to be done now mitigation measures will have to be taken not ad hoc you cannot start thinking about mitigation measures chat it has to be part of a plan for every type of disaster the national disaster management plan today talks of 17 type of hazards the 17 type of disasters which includes forest fires which includes tsunami which includes rail air accidents Uh, nuclear power plant accidents and standard ones like uh, earthquake uh, flood and uh, hurricanes etc but for each kind of disaster you have to have a disaster mitigation plan and which has to be which does not have to be general plan this has to be area specific community specific disaster specific and the hazard specific that is how you will know the measures taken for uh against a biological disaster possibly mitigation measures are different then uh measures taken to impact uh, the, uh, the measures taken to reduce the impact of a cyclone in the uh, coastal areas like we saw taute striking the western coast last uh, summer 2020 one summers and in the same month we had the east coast affected including west bengal all the three coastal districts got affected so the measures are different there could be overlap like there are there are cross cutting issues of uh, say medical preparedness it's common for earthquake it's common for hurricane it's common for uh, medical uh, disaster per se the biological disaster per se but these have to be done beforehand in in in, in uh, terms of certain programs and they cannot be ad hoc like we can have school safety programs against earthquakes against fires we have public awareness program for all kind of disaster depending upon the geographical area and the vulnerabilities of a particular uh, geographical area and uh, like coastal zones of the eastern sector are not as badly vulnerable to earthquakes as the uh, areas in the himalayan belt but so the, your public awareness programs have to focus accordingly and uh, your plans for job creation after disaster strikes how how to sustain the economic activity that itself is a mitigating Uh, disaster mitigating uh, strategy disaster mitigation angle so uh, many factors you will see which which apply to disaster prevention will also apply to disaster mitigation and that is why i said disaster management is not a watertight compartment of preparedness response uh, reconstruction and then mitigation etc it's a ongoing activity and it's it's interconnected and it's it's overlapping so there is a natural linkage between disaster prevention and disaster mitigation prevention in quotes where it is possible to prevent so the state of medical preparedness for example state of medical preparedness and uh, earthquake resilient housing in context of earthquakes now this is uh, prevention and uh mitigation together if you have earthquake resilient buildings possibly earthquake you can't prevent but you are mitigating the impact some houses may not collapse at all so 
So that is why I was trying to focus uh, focus on this issue of this integrated process of disaster management. Like you can see on the screen now, that you plan, you organize, you coordinate what all measures for preventing, for mitigating, for capacity building, for preparedness, response, evacuation, rescue, relief, and these are overlapping. That is why I'm very fond of showing this slide because uh, disaster management has to be seen as a whole and not as a particular part of the management activity. Now, how it is done and what are the basic mitigation measures? Uh, can we cite some examples uh, how this mitigation can be done and how it is happening on ground? See, take your mind to, again, earthquake, cyclone, floods. Uh, if you strengthen the buildings to render them more res resistant against cyclones or floods, you are actually taking a mitigation step. Uh, if you have hazard resistance incorporated into structures or procedures to be followed in all the development projects, or take your mind back to the Bhuj earthquake, the district hospital collapse, district minister's office collapse, the police station collapse. And that is why today, in all the developmental activities, we say that we have to have disaster resilient structures uh, so that our critical infrastructure is not damaged during a disaster. Once our critical infrastructure like hospitals, um, airports, uh, railway lines, uh, your power stations, uh, if they are surviving and they are operational, if the business continuity goes on, imagine the kind of help you can get for for uh, disaster management per se, and in particularly in the response phase when there is too much of too much of confusion, too much of loss of life, property destruction. It's a warlike situation, to be very frank. So uh, this uh, disaster mitigation will come from ensuring that mitigation is is embedded into the development projects of the country. Similarly. Uh, we we have talked of uh, biological disasters. There is there is a uh, if if there is a uh, disaster to a disaster of the kind where our plants get diseased, where our crops get diseased, you have to have multi cropping. You have to have various type of uh, seeds. You have to have disasters in seeds, and all that takes time. Uh, today, uh, if a particular variety of rice gets diseased and and we get less crop. Um, there will be another variety which will not get affected. And that is what is uh, mitigation measures and research and development to ensure that our food grains don't affect. Uh, changing crop cycle also, uh, that is crop mature, mature crops are harvested well in time. Uh, that is called smart harvesting. Uh, we know flood and cyclone seasons more or less. And if, if they're not taking a surprise, if some crop is ready, you have to have pattern of uh, cropping uh, so that you lose less and less of grain. Uh, adoption of land use planning and controls restrict activities in high risk area. We talked of coastal zone. We talked of coastal zone regulation yesterday. Um, speakers have talked about it. So this all land use planning. Uh, I, I'm so, so uh, excited to know that yesterday uh, Sundarban was touched in particular the kind of damage which is done to flora and fauna and our environment is cannot possibly be measured. It's only, it, it will not even be known today. It will be known only after 20 years, 30 years, 40 years when you see the impact on ground. So this land use planning and how you how we um, use our land itself is a uh, mitigation strategy and uh, economic diversification so that one kind of a job loss does not result in, into uh, affect the other one and all. All there is a mitigation. So disasters and development, like I told you before, you need to understand the correlation. Uh, disasters will give a chance for development, chance for reconstruction. But if that reconstruction is not done with due disaster resilience and with due uh, attention to the mitigation strategies, that development itself will become a hazard. Then, then you're not going in for a disaster resilient um, disaster resilient development. So all development activities, if you think that I am going to create a dam, I am going to create a railway line, and uh, what is the environmental impact assessment, uh, and uh, what is uh, going to be the uh, uh, 
uh, impact on risk reduction, whether it will risk to reduce or increase, then you would possibly do the right, uh, you know, the right lines to take the right mitigation measure. Take example of uh, a dam. Today, a dam uh, creating a huge water body uh, may possibly is a developmental activity which will uh, work against droughts, which will which will help your economy, which will help you having more grain production. And uh, at the same time, are you creating a risk of floods? Are you creating a risk of some kind of a risk, whether the dam break is there or it's not being uh, managed properly like it happened in Kerala floods? Um, there's a lot of delay in timely opening of the dam gates. And suddenly gates had to be opened because of, uh, because of the uh, level of water going up uh, beyond a, beyond a um, point of safety. So all this has to be taken into construction, uh, consideration. Uh, I'm right now sitting in Kashmir 2014. There were Srinagar floods and uh, I attended a couple of discussions and seminars uh, where uh, some people were saying, yes, we never had the floods in Srinagar town, but this particular railway line has come from um, uh, come into the valley of uh, into the Jhelum Valley. And now very soon we'll be able to travel from Delhi right up to Baramula, which is which is only about 40, 50 kilometers from our line of control with Pakistan. So, so um, uh, they were saying that this particular railway line, railway embankment, which has come, this is not allowed the water to go into the flood plains. And that is how the city of Srinagar has got uh, unprecedented floods. Uh, that was not the that was not indeed the basic reason but this kind of discussions are going on the basic reason to to my mind was that uh, right from the and i'm talking about land use planning now uh, for mitigating disaster it was that particular thing was totally lost sight of uh, in the time of uh, uh, maharaja hari singh even before india got india got its freedom uh, there were spill channels along jhelum and those spill channels when the water was uh, when there were heavy rains, the spill channels would take the water away from the town and join the river again downstream. And that is how the town was never flooded. But over a period of time, all this land um, uh, use was changed. All the spill channels were not maintained. All the low-lying areas through which water is to be diverted and again joining the main Jhelum stream, uh, all have become residential areas. The water had no place to go and at a particular point of time, when uh, there were heavy rains, a flood occurred. Same thing has happened in uh, Chennai flood, and same thing happens in so many urban floods which you hear today. So it is it is land use planning which goes goes heavier, and that is one of the reasons for urban floods like Srinagar or or uh, Chennai. So effective mitigation, uh, we have spoken in, in general terms as to what is disaster mitigation. Uh, now let us see basic prerequisites. How 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 this will happen. So one of the basic requirement of good mitigation is a proper national policy. You need a proper policy, which again, policy means we are not, we are not ad hoc. We are writing, putting on a paper. What is our aim? What do we want? What do, how do we want to reduce disasters in long run? And at the same time, once you put the policy on ground, um, you we hear of climate change now and then we say of erratic behavior of um, uh, weather, sometimes too much water, sometimes in summers, uh, temperatures going on beyond a point, in winters not raining properly. Again, in Srinagar, today people are saying that we haven't had enough snow. Now, if they don't have enough snow in this season, the apple crop will go for a six because water seeps slowly into the into the uh, ground and that is what is required, I'm told, for a good, good harvest of apple and uh, other varieties which are grown here. So, we have to uh, keep monitoring the uh, hazards and vulnerabilities. How the hazards and vulnerabilities are are are, are, are uh, mutating is not the right word, but they, they the 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 form the the impact the, it keeps changing to the nuances to hazards, it's rains and heavy rains and very heavy rains. So and that vulnerabilities also keep uh, varying. So we have to assess because the, and then only you will able to draw the right mitigation uh, uh, measures. Adequate and accurate analysis of ongoing project, uh, project has to be done. Now, if you spend government money, if you're doing mitigation projects, for example, 
if you are making a uh, walls um, near the villages which are which are a uh, flood uh, vulnerable to floods or, or embankment not the walls embankments but uh, whether it is being done uh, with due assessment of the real vulnerability or we are making embankment uh, just that sometimes uh, 50 years once a flood may come then you better not do that uh, activity because your money is scarce now once you talk of it to mitigation at government level uh, governments also have to take take into into consideration the the community needs how community wants to reduce their own disasters when when uh, we cannot impose things on community communities have me have their own way of surviving they have their own sense of uh, social security economic security security hazards and we have to see that our all our government policies if they can strengthen the requirements of communities for risk mitigation for, for disaster risk we would be doing a mitigation effectively and also like you can see in the second bullet we have measures in national development plans like i spoke some time back and including the immediate and long-term cost benefit implication of taking or not taking mitigation action so you first of all the word mainstreaming whatever you do you disaster risk reduction has to, has to be mainstream into all developmental activities and by government of india by by law 10 percent of your project cost can be spent in risk mitigation disaster risk, risk mitigation activities it means simply if you're making a housing project worth 100 crores of the government money is a government project you can easily easily spend out of 100 crores 10 crores on ensuring that the whole project is earthquake resilient or uh, flood water resilient if, if that kind of thing is there so that is one point and second is long term or short term cost benefit like i told you some time back you may it may be easier for us to evacuate a group of villages every year even if the flood comes and then put them back after the floods and that is how the communities have been surviving the famous Ganga Yona plains starting from uh, Haridwar right up to uh, Calcutta. Uh, people have been surviving floods. They move to the areas where water comes and the water goes, they come back and they do agriculture there. They actually capitalize on the on the, the way nature brings more water to flood plains. Rather than staying there, getting affected and then crying that you lost crop, you lost lives, all those things. But there are many other factors to it. It's not only um moving out of the flood place people are staying by by virtue of certain social compulsion sort of um, uh, economic compulsion people are staying in the flood place people are staying in vulnerable areas so we have to have a comprehensive disaster management plan because mitigation is part of the disaster management uh, activity so you also have to have uh specialized structures like we have ndma sdmas and district disaster management authorities because unless you have these structures, there will nobody to focus on the needs which arise from time to time. And there's nobody to advise the urban local bodies at the district level, uh, the state governments and the central government to take precautions against various disasters. Today, the uh, NDMA is supposed to have uh, all the policy plans, research, development, forethought for risk reduction has to be done very very um uh, very very uh, well placed very knowledgeable uh, members at the prime minister himself is the chairperson and similar in the same lines in states the chief minister himself is the chairperson because the group of the members of sdmas uh, have to tell the chief minister as to what is not happening uh, for reducing risk in the state rather than what is happening in terms of various plans which is already known to the chief minister or which is already known to the government of india so coming to um, if requirement mitigation, uh, you have to have a procedure for post disaster review. Uh, last year, you must have heard uh, there was a flash floods in Holi Ganga, where some uh, hydrology project was going on ahead, ahead of Yoshimad in Garhwal Himalayas. And um, now after this disaster, uh, if we have learned the lesson, if we're doing the mitigation, 
then possibly a similar disaster should never take place. There should be no water coming in the vicinity of a hydrogen project without warning. We, we may lose the project, but we should not lose, the, uh, lose lives, which is what exactly happened. The requirement was to put some even visual, uh, visual sentries, the visual observers, 50 kilometers, 30 kilometers upstream, and uh, send the message that there is, there is a uh, dam break somewhere, there is a glacier break somewhere, and water is gushing. And uh, the whole valley where the construction was being done was not more than 150 meter wide. So even if a man was walking with five minutes, five minutes of uh, early warning, your lives could be saved, but it didn't happen. So the post disaster review of all major events has to be done. Uh, similarly, now uh, we had the COVID first wave, COVID second wave, um, Omicron came. Um, we have to learn from what happened in first wave, what happened in second wave, and how we are vulnerable to third wave, and possibly, God forbid, we don't know how it will behave. But uh, you must have seen a very, very positive thing was happening uh, around second wave, that we thought our children would get affected. And in first and second wave, when we, we were short of ICUs, then people were thinking of ICUs for children. Pediatric ICUs were being thought of. Um, we now are thinking how to have um, dedicated oxygen capacity in more and more hospitals. Uh, big hospitals uh, already had this oxygen generation plants with them, but they were, they were not many. So that is how you to remove special oxygen trains from industry right up to Calcutta, Delhi, Mumbai, and that oxygen had to be distributed. But this post as a review has to be done as to what went wrong, and so that in future we should not be found wanting of ICUs. We should not be found wanting of oxygen. If some new challenges come. We are a strong enough nation. To handle it that will do but what has already happened has to be learned now we already spoken of these issues like um, multi-cropping and uh, you have to have agriculture programs with mitigation in mind now uh, multi-cropping uh, or our type of uh, different type of crops now with the government is giving subsidies today for uh, for crop other than wheat so why it is happening? Because of ensuring that ensuring uh, reduce the risk against any biological disasters. Plus, there are nutritional issues. Uh, now, um, again, like uh, on the lighter side of it, the yoga is being taught to Indian Indians from as it has come the West. Similarly, um, multigrain atta we are eating on advice of West. Otherwise, multigrain was order of day in every household because we used to grow uh, crop like that. Similarly. Now, the famous Ken Betwa project, uh, yesterday you must have heard the budget, five rivers, there are going to five projects which are going to join rivers. And Ken Betwa in Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh border, the Bundelkhand region uh, itself is an example of disaster risk mitigation because once successful, it will take care of the ongoing drought in the Bundelkhand area. So this is what all is mitigation about. And... Uh, Similarly, traditional measures for mitigation have to be taken note of that traditional earthquake resilient constructions to go to Gadwal Himalayas, uh, go to Himachal, you'll still find some buildings uh, constructed in a particular type of architectural design and they have not been affected. They have not been affected for so many earthquakes they have survived. Today in Northeast, in uh, uh, Manipur and in so many other states where there is a lot of bamboo available. People are making houses out of bamboo which don't get affected uh, by earthquakes. Whereas the whole belt is in zone 4 and zone 5. And uh, as a step of, you now there's a need to mesh old and new. People who like to have better design, better houses, they will not like to stay in bamboo houses like the uh, ancestors used to stay 100 years back. So there is research and development going on, on mixing these uh, proper structural engineering tools, the structural engineering material, uh, say cement, and all the things which you use in normal uh, housing along with bamboo. So that all thing is going on and there are a lot of projects where uh, bamboo is being used to give strength to the uh, standard construction material. But that is Sir. an example of traditional earthquake resilient construction. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Actually, uh, Dr. Kallan Rudra, sir, uh, General okay. Chairman of West Bengal Pollution Control Board, he yeah. has got an urgent meeting Okay. So that's why uh, if you kindly sum up 
Uh, yes. Right. We will do that. We will do that. So we have generally told about uh, mitigation and just to tell you, and since we have to close, uh, we have our policies and plans to accommodate all the requirements of uh, such such uh, good risk disaster mitigation and that is in form of uh, we will not talk of structural and non structural mitigation now we have a national disaster management plan we have a national disaster management uh, policy which talks of which talks of proper disaster uh, mitigation and this uh, structural and non structural is basically education awareness and structural is basically the construction and making sure that our buildings and all are uh, okay. Uh, legal framework is non-structural measure. Incentives is non-structural measures. Then training education. I leave this presentation with the uh, faculty and uh, whatever you're doing with public awareness is also non-structural measures. So our, our warning, warning system today, uh, we, we survived um, last year, two major cyclones, very few casualties, six between Orissa and West Bengal in cyclone, yes. How? Because the India Med Department gave very good early warning. And uh, with that, uh, I think I'll stop here. And we have various plans and policies. We have this national plan on uh, disaster management, which talks of disasters. Which And one of the pillars of disaster plan is the community level disaster management. And also, all mitigation projects have to be identified well in advance. We have this act, which is the, which is the force behind all activities today if a state government is not doing enough for disaster mitigation it can be asked questions as per law and uh, similarly we have a plan as i said a very detailed plan and this is a complete chapter on mitigation of disaster for all the 17 hazards which are there in front of you now and uh, it is very well designed and if you follow it you will actually need uh, need don't have to invent reinvent the wheel and we have very famous um, a mitigation program like National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Program, uh, which is very successful. We have landslide risk mitigation scheme going on, flood risk mitigation scheme going on, and so on. At national level, a lot of schemes are going on. We have to just uh, weave into them. We have to just uh, integrate with them. And with that, uh, I'll stop here. And uh, uh, I'll be uh, available even after the um, second talk. If there are any discussion questions, we can always uh, to handle it and thank you so much for the opportunity dr rajoti thank you thank you dr naik sir for such a wonderful lecture we will be highly enlightened from your lecture now i would like to request dr kollan rutro chairman of west bengal pollution control board government of west bengal dr kollan rutro is presently chairman of west bengal pollution control board and former member of central pollution control board he is a geographer by academic training, having specialization in river and water management. He has been the expert member in the committee constituted by the Apex Court of the State for cleaning the Ganga since 2005. Dr. Rudra was a member of the National Flood Management Core Group and headed the committee constituted to advise the government of West Bengal on the issue of Indo-Bangladesh sharing of Tista water. Dr. Rudro also worked with the International Union for Conservation of Nature to prepare Indo-Bangladesh Transboundary River Atlas. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Colin Rudro, sir. Uh, thank you, Bulu. Mm. Just a minute. Uh, can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, sir. It's visible. Uh, am I audible? I understand. Yes, sir. Uh, you are audible. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, how much time I'm allowed to speak? How much time? I, I will maintain that. I... Sir, 30, uh, 40, 40 minutes. Okay. 40 Thank minutes. you. That is enough for me. Uh, 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 
my dear friends, myself as introduced, I am chairman of the Pollution Control Board, but last four decades or so, I was trying to understand uh, the dynamic river system of the GBM Delta, that is Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Delta. And one of my special area of interest had been uh, Sundarbon. And for last few years, I'm trying to understand how the climate change is impacting the coastline of undivided Bengal. Uh, the very picture, what you see in on my screen, is is the last village mm, of of a of an island uh, where people are continuously retreating, and you can see this the how the sea is encroaching gradually inland and they have frequent cyclonic storm surge it is it seems to be one of the paradox of geomorphology that in spite of the fact that the ganga brahmaputra meghna system carries highest sediment load in the world the coastline along the west bengal delta that is the western part of the GBM delta is not growing. Rather, it is called retrograding delta. That is, sea is advancing very fast. In the contrary, uh, the the coastline along Bangladesh, because of the receiving the sediment load by the Meghna and Brahmaputra and the Ganga system, it is growing southward. So this is a very complex delta where one part is retrograding, other part is prograding. I was trying to understand these dynamics of the, of the delta uh, since 1780 when James Rennell published the first scientific atlas of Bengal. Uh, This is the map of one of the maps published by James Rennell. He had been the first surveyor general of the East India Company, uh, taking over the administrative control of the of the Bengal uh, after the Battle of Polasi in 1757. They realized that uh, a complete geographical understanding of the tract is required to rule a country. So what they did. They invited James Rennell, basically a marine surveyor, to survey the riverine route initially from Kolkata to Dhaka, then subsequently the other parts of the country. Bengal at that point of time uh, was the Bengal presidency covering entire Bangladesh right at this moment, western part of the Assam, Bihar, and parts of the Odisha too. So it was a large tract. And if you look at this map, you can see the Sundarbon at that point of time was extended even up to Kolkata. And it was a huge tract covering more than 20,000 square kilometer of the, of the Delta tract. There are, there were about 50 islands facing the sea, being enriched by the sediment load carried by the Ganga Brahmaputra system. When I compared this with the subsequent map and, or the satellite image, I find that uh, the, the coastal tract of Bengal has appreciably changed. Before I go into that, I would like to give you some basic information about Sundarbund. Uh, the entire tract of the coastal Bengal is within two to four meters above mean sea level. But the storm surge may achieve six to seven meter and even higher than that the last one what my uh, previous speaker was talking about the yes when normal tidal fluctuation tidal level at Sagor island was 7.5 meter which is his, which was historically the highest normal tidal fluctuation in Sudarbon may be two meter but but the but the storm surge may may pull the water to the level of six, seven meter. The littoral tract of Bengal is hydrogeomorphologically very sensitive where fluvial 
and marine land building processes are juxtaposed. That is, that means the freshwater as well as the saline water regime are juxtaposed in Sundarbon. There are about 13 major creeks, starting from Shagor in the west, Ganga Shagor in the west, to Meghna estuary in the east. And there are 11 in between, which carries the water into the sea. When the river goes up during high tide, these creeks have a tendency to widen itself, spill off, uh, and submerge the adjoining intertidal space. Unfortunately, without realizing this hydrogeomorphology of the Sundarbon Delta, the colonial rivers, the colonial rulers started to reclaim Sundarbon. They cleared forest from 54 islands along the western side of the Sundarbon and completely deforested the area. And then, and what they did, the natural protection against the cyclonic storm surge disappeared from the western side of this of, of the Bengal Delta. And that gave the opportunity of the coastal uh, uh, cyclone to strike or enter the land easily without any interruption. In addition, what they did, they embanked the creeks. Earthen embankments were, were built along the both sides of the rivers uh, so that rivers does not allow to, uh, rivers are not allowed to spill off. And this spill off mechanism has one major impact that it left behind the sediment load, suspended sediment load, and then come back relatively silt free water into the river. So thus, the sediment dispersal mechanism was also interrupted by the construction of the embankment. Thus, the entire hydroecological balance of the delta was interrupted. In addition, we have a tectonic change of the Bengal delta, that is the what we call Holocene eastward tilt of the delta, that is the basement on which the sediment load is deposited is gradually tilted eastward. And this has led to the eastward migration of the main flow of the Ganga through Padma, leaving behind the Vagirothi, Jalangi, Mathabhanga, Gorai and many other distributary channels. And Padda gradually rejuvenated itself and migrating the entire water in towards the Bangladesh. This is one of the reasons why we had to build Farakka Barad and divert some water towards the Bhagirathi Hugli River. But these kinds of human intervention, along with the natural neotectonism of the, of, the, of the Bengal Delta, has put us in a very difficult situation. If you look at this satellite image, uh, you can see the sediment load being deposited on, 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 the, on the continental shelf. This red part is definitely the Sundarbon forest. And, but if you look at the, this western part, this is, this is the Shagor Island, where the famous Kamishmuri temple, this is here is the Moushuni, here is the, uh, uh, the Namkhana, etc., etc., and here is the G plot. The entire western part of the delta is completely deforested. Its forest lies somewhere here, rather along the, along the eastern part of, of the West Bengal delta. I was comparing how much forest cover we have lost. I overlaid three maps. One, that of the James Rennell, which I showed, which was published in 1780, when Bengal, undivided Bengal, had a forest cover of more than 20,000 square kilometer. In 1841, one cartographer named Tassin, J. B. Tassin, surveyed Bengal. And he published another map where he showed that the Bengal uh, coast has a forest cover of about 1,700 and 740 to 45 square kilometer. When I was comparing with that of the recent satellite image, I find it is about 10,435 square kilometer. That means since 1780, we have lost about 
80% of the forest cover uh, and this has a, this has created a serious ecological imbalance if you look at this kind of estuary creeks in sundarbon what we find that tide goes up to this level up to this level and submerge the entire intertidal space and leaves behind the sediment load this is the normal sediment dispersal mechanism and it is that process which helped to develop this largest delta of the world but when we constructed this kind of embankment what we find here is the low tide line here is the high tide line normal condition fluctuation tidal fluctuation may be two meter if you extend this line or if you just withdraw this embankment the entire habitable area as well as the agricultural field will be submerged during the high tide but negative impact of this is that the rivers are not allowed to spill off during high tide and com we compel the river to deposit the sediment load on on the river bed thereby river bed has achieved such a height during high tide that entire sundarbon is will be submerged under 2 meter of water if we just withdraw the embankment the length of the embankment according to official record right at this moment is 3500 kilometer but what we call effective embankment may be to the tune of 1800 kilometer but it what happens these embankments are mostly earthen embankment with some paving or brick covering but this does not allow a full proof strength or to to endure the thrust during the storm surge what happens either the gnawing river breach this embankment or it overtops the embankment and whenever it overtops the embankment the entire agricultural field is submerged under the saline water and water remains stagnant for about about two three weeks leaving a layer of salinity on the topsoil making the land totally non-productive this happens during the the isla and subsequent storm surge if you look at this picture what happens there on you can see the long embankment is breached here and you can see the height of the river achieved during the cyclone and subsequent high tide and it submerged the entire village area so this situation is become increasingly complex uh, and this is definitely because of the climate change i was working on the impact of climate change on on sundarbon or bengal delta uh, bengal coast what i find that sea surface temperature what we precisely call sst has increased about 1.04 degree centigrade since 1950 while the global sea surface temperature has increased only 0.65 degree centigrade that means bay of bengal is being warmed at a faster rate than the global average the bay of bengal sea surface temperature is increasing at the rate of 0.5 degree centigrade per decade while the globally observed sea surface temperature increase is only 0.06 degree centigrade that means bay of bengal is being uh, warmed at the rate eight times higher than the global average sea level is rising in sundarbon at the rate higher than the global average in the past 25 years sea level has gone up, up almost double the rate of the global average in addition we have a problem of land subsidence land subsidence means the land here is newly built very newly built the sediment load which is being auto compacted and subsiding at the rate of about 2.9 mm per year so if you club together i was looking at the last report of the intergovernmental panel on climate change which says that sea level is rising 
recenting at the rate of 3.6 millimeter per year. So if we, while I was looking at the other data of satellite based monitoring, it says that the Bay of Bengal is rising at the rate of uh, uh, 4 millimeter plus minus 4 millimeter. So if we accept that 4 millimeter and if you effective rise of the sea level is subsidence of land at the rate of 2.9 millimeter plus 3.6 millimeter is a sea level rise. That means together the effective sea level rise will be more than 6.5 millimeter per year. Intensity of cyclone has also increased. If you go through the recently published hazard plus by the IMD, you will find that yes, it is admitted that sea level is uh, our Bay of Bengal uh, has recorded increasing tendency of uh, storm surge and cyclones. It is it has increased by about 26 percent during the last 20, 120 years. And 79 cyclones have devastated Sundarbans since 1901. But recent four cyclones, that is Isla, Bulbul, Amphan, and Iyas, have ravaged Indian Sundarbans. I was just compiling the database after the years when government of West Bengal constituted a very high power committee with 24 experts, and I was requested to be to be the chairman of the committee, I was compiling the data. Look at this. This is the ILA. And it appeared on 25th May 2009. And this is the wind speed. And this is the time of high tide. And this is the high tide level. Whenever the high tide and cyclonic storm surge, a landfall, synchronized, the disaster was knew no bound, rather disaster, quote unquote, maybe a weak expression to describe what happens in Sundarbon. If you look gradually that since 2009, there was no major cyclone during subsequent 10 years. In 2019, that is after about 10 years, we recorded Bulbul. And then subsequently, we have three cyclones, very short interval, that is Bulbul in 2019, Amphan in 2020, and Yas in 2021. That is within a span of about 1.18 uh, uh, or 19 months, we recorded three cyclones. Most interesting is that in case of last one, the normal tidal high, high tide level was 7.5 meters compared to about 4.2 to 4.7, 4.67. That means that the water level was already about 3 meters above the average high tide line of, of, of Sundarbon. And a wind speed of about 130 to 40 kilometers dragged it. And if you compare this landfall time and the high tide, High tide time, highest high tide time was 9.15 at the morning. And if you look at the date and time and location, at when it struck, it was about 10.30. That means high tide almost coincided with the cyclonic land, landfall. And that caused the disaster. Almost entire Sundarbon and the district of East Midnapur, Digha, Shagor Island, Mogshumi, Bhuramara, all these were devastated. I was comparing the <clears throat> uh, multi-dated images and maps. If you look at that, the Shagor Island where it was the cluster was where the cluster of six islands in 1780 when James Rennell published his map. Since then, the sea has encroached more than eight kilometers. We are afraid that this Kopil Muni temple, where millions of people congregate on the day of the winter solstice, or what we call Makar Sankranti, that temple is threatened. We have consulted many experts. And IIT Chennai was also consulted. What they proposed? that we need to construct some offshore intervention. That is, 
about 150 to 200 meter downstream of the low tide line, they proposed a offshore barrier reefs. Offshore barrier reefs means an horizontal wall uh, to break the wave they are on. But it is a very costly intervention. 2.3 kilometer long barrier reef will cost more than 66 scroll. What I am afraid that if you just put an the Sagar Island has a width of about 14 kilometers from west to east along the seafront. If you just put a barrier somewhere in between, having a length of about 2.3 kilometers, the intensity of erosion along the both ends will increase. So what I think that this is also the territorial boundary of the country. Entire Sundarbans Southern Front is the territorial boundary of the country. So it is really, really beyond the scope of the state government to intervene and incur such a huge amount of money. And in addition, this is the world heritage site. We need to protect it. And that involves a huge uh, monetary involvement. And I believe the state government as well as central government should come forward and to do the needful to protect the, uh, uh, the coastal tract of Bengal. What I am doing here, I was also looking at the century scale change of, of the Bengal Delta. There was one map published by the Survey of India in 1917 topographical sheet. I had the opportunity to look that map at, at uh, British Museum, British uh, Library. And I overlaid this. I find that how the coastal, this had been the, this has been the 17, 1917. Here, the entire coastline has changed. You can, the black line is to 20, 2020. And if you look at the 1780 and just overlaid, there's a very simple GIS solution. You will find how the shape of the island has, has also changed. Not only the habitable islands are sinking, but the other densely forest cover areas are also sinking because the climate change impacts and cyclones are so powerful. Here is a one island called Ghoramara. Uh, Ghoramara is shrinking at a very faster rate. We have already lost Suparivanga, Lohachora, Bedford, and many other islands. There was one island what I visited with my friend Professor Sunanda Bandhapadhyay long back, uh, about 16 kilometers downstream of the Shagor Island, uh, that was Chuksha, that is no more there. There was one island along the Indo Bangladesh border that was named as Niumur Island that has also disappeared. So coastline is very fast changing. But if you compare that with that of the Bangladesh, they are the gaining land at a very fast rate. This black line is the 2020 and this yellow line is the 1970. You can see the how much land they have. If you look at the Noah Khali, when Gandhiji visited this Noah Khali, uh, the coastline was somewhere here. But now it is about 30 kilometers downstream somewhere here. So because it receives sediment load, suspended sediment load of the combined flow of the Ganga, Brahmaputra and Meghna. So they are gaining the land. So what are we are doing, we are trying to protect our embankment with this kind of uh, embankment. Sometimes earthen, sometimes concrete, but that is not enough. Uh, they don't have the strength to protect the coast from the cyclonic storm surge. I was visiting the houses, the, how people are migrating continuously inland. This is this picture I took uh, from, from the southern point of the Moshuni Island. And these people are continuously migrated. A group of neo refugees or what we call environmental refugees are emerging. They are continuously shifting inland. So when government of West Bengal uh, constituted the committee, we worked uh, together. What we propose, this earthen embankment needs a vegetative cover. There are two kinds of uh, embankment. One is the earthen riverine embankment like this one, or the picture what I have shown earlier. 
what we propose they need a geo textile cover and some vegetative wall can be created we have proposed it when there is space in front of the river we can create it a vegetative wall there on but problem is that the land required to create the create this kind of vegetative shield is not available in many places problem is that the river banks are most densely populated but according to crz regulation this area should be left as open space but you know for the last 200 years or so sundarbon 4.5 million people are living there on so we have proposed two kind of solution for riverine embankment we have advised for vegetative solution or creating vegetative wall 1 2 3 4 5 M maybe three in front two in back side backward riverine sorry village side and in case of coastal area we have proposed one dike here that is along the last limit of the high tide line and another dike about 500 meter away from this and the area in between should we should create a vegetative shield but creation of a vegetable shield requires a proper vegetable shield requires more than a decade so we will have to understand that in between we will have to rely on more and more on civil engineering intervention and if required we will have to do some offshore intervention that is intervention on water but we must keep in mind that this region is delicately balanced a very ecologically sensitive region so personally i have some observation that in absence of forest cover west bengal coast is bearing the thrust of the storm embankment does not allow the normal sediment dispersal mechanism during high tide thus delta building is interrupted but present sundarbon is subsiding there are many evidences of that there are archaeological ruins explored from different parts of the sundarbon which are believed to be during the period of 300 bc to 1200 ad the big question is that how an area which is regularly submerged by the tidal fluctuation can support such a civilization there are two possible answer one is land was relatively higher at that point of time or second is that by some earthquake the land has subsided inviting the sea further inland and that led to the decline of this civilization the storm intensity or cyclonic intensity and sea level rise seems to be the greatest challenge combined with the lap subsidence of land so gbm delta in spite of influx of 1 billion tons of sediment load every year into the estuary this delta we are losing our land we have lost more than 250 square kilometer land from west bengal coast during the period 1970 to 20, 2020 on the contrary the islands along the meghna estuary has gained more than 510 square kilometer land i understand this is governed by the nature but that if you consider the our carbon footprint the sundarban people has very little carbon footprint they have no they should not be blamed for this climate change they should not be blamed for the rising sea level they are living in with a very in a very difficult situation so we have to understand that some kind of vegetative solution some kind of intervention which is which is rather uh, i i uh, we just matches with the present ecosystem balance of sundarbon uh, since late 18th century at the, at the conclusion i i must uh, refer to that that since the late 18th century uh, engineering of command and control emerged in europe 
with an understanding among the some engineers that we can alter the nature and we can win over the nature. And that was a wrong concept. And now many scientists have realized that that we will have to live with the nature. We will have to understand the ecological balance of the nature. We will have to understand the hydrologic, geomorphological processes operating in Sundarbon. And we will have to plan accordingly. Otherwise, all attempts will be, it will be futile. And this future of nat nation uh, or the future citizen of the country uh, will, will, be, will be just disappear from the, this earth. With these few words, I thank you all for your patient hearing and giving me this opportunity to speak before you. Thank you. Uh, lately, we have heard and saw on TV and news channels, newspapers about the devastating effects on different cyclones like Amphan, Yash, Bulbul in Shundarban in recent years. So these lectures will, will help us to understand more about these issues. And thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your inspiring and very timely lecture. And uh, if anyone has any query, they may ask, uh, feel free to ask questions to our panelists. I saw Koshik Mondol and Gurpit Singh. Koshik, please, uh, you may ask your name. Yes. Koshi Mandal, are you here? Or Gurpit Singh Talwandi? If you have any queries to our resource persons, you may ask. Okay, I don't think so. So, uh, Bulu ma'am, you can proceed for our next speaker. Yes, sir. So now I would like to request. And thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rudra, sir, for your thank wonderful you. speech. And as always, and thank you, thank you Dr. Weekend I, sir, also. And uh, really, it's uh, very, very informative. Dr. Us. Dr. Rudra, sir, thank you so much. I was, in yes. fact, I am very lucky. I could sit through 40 minutes and listen to what you say. Thank and a uh, lot of what you're saying is a great concern. I only hope. It, it, you have a long public service also. Uh, it goes to the um, people who can actually take decisions and do something worthwhile with such good advices, such technical things available with us. We have no dearth of um, good scientists, good academic, academicians and all. But now issue is how, how best we can do it. Even other sir, kinds of governance. Yeah, yeah. Sir, I, I took the point from your lecture that you you said that the people of Bengal and all other India learn to live with flood. They sometimes they used to welcome the flood, and there was bumper crop subsequently. Yes. But the yes. change of flood has subsequently the nature of flood has changed, uh, yes. and making the. Uh, I hope sometimes we will meet, maybe in Delhi or somewhere else, and we will try to work together. Certainly, sir. Abar dakhao bhi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, now I would like to request Kumar Ovinay uh, for his lecture. Kumar Ovinay is currently working as an architect and disaster manager. He has completed MTEC in the Exchange Fellow at Chair of uh, Environmental Development and Risk Management at TU Dresden, Germany. Presently, he is pursuing PhD at Department of Architecture and Planning, IIT Roorkee. He has been a young professional at uh, NIDM and inter intern at GIDM. His area of interest are disaster risk reduction, socio-economic aspect of disaster management, disaster relief shelter, risk assessment, urban flood management, artwork uh, resilient, uh, design architecture planning. So now it's up to you. I, uh, it's The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bulu, ma'am. Uh, I am very thankful to NIDM and Syed for providing me this opportunity to share the dais with Major General VK sir and Kalyan Rudra sir. Very, very uh, sincere 
namaskar to you too sir i am very young to you guys and i am very fortunate to share uh, the speaking dais with you guys today i will be uh, presenting uh, sorry wait a minute yeah so today i will be presenting uh, on the topic coastal hazard evaluation a review of current techniques and their application in multi skill study so uh, we will be reviewing the hazard evaluation techniques used in current times and what are their applications in multi skill study which can help in mitigating the coastal hazards and coming up with recommendations which will uh, help us to uh, mitigate it to the maximum extent uh, is my screen visible bulu ma'am yes it's visible yeah okay thank you so first of all we should be uh, we all are very aware of the importance of coastal zone so uh, a brief introduction about that that the total length of the world coastlines is about 5 lakh 40 uh, 5 lakh 4000 kilometers that is enough to circle the equator 12 times this is a very important uh, region for our earth which is also uh, very important to be conserved and preserved uh, in, for our future needs so Uh, as you can see here the importance of coastal zones can be seen here with the uh, the extent of population in that area which is uh, like about a, uh, maximum population is density is in the coastal regions where we can see that the population density is about 80% per square kilometer that is twice the global average population density and we can see that more than 70% of the world's mega cities are situated near to the coastal areas apart from this coastal ecosystem is 90% of global fisheries and it is a major source of income for fishermen in our coastal areas apart from that reefs are very important and mangroves as uh, rudra sir was talking about the importance of uh, sundarban delta uh, mangroves in that area how it helps in reducing the uh, effect of the cyclone and uh, storm surges in that area so this is the uh, need of coastal lines apart from that we can see more than a billion people rely on fish as their main sole source of animal protein apart from that tourism is a economical point of view where uh, coastlines uh, attract a lot of tourists and generate a lot of income for our uh, country as well as at, at the global level apart from that estuaries and lagoons fjords are also very important for our fresh water and uh, supplies moving on to the next coastal hazards may be defined defined as the occurrence of a phenomenon which has the potential for causing damage to or loss of natural ecosystem buildings and infrastructures so we can see that any uh, it's a combination of various hazards which includes storms floods coastal floodings uh, uh, salt water intrusion which collectively could be termed as coastal hazards and this could be uh, due to the natural phenomenon or it could be due to man made uh, activities so coastal hazards can be of two types categorized in two two categories one is a rapid onset hazards where storms are frequent uh, so we saw cyclones we have witnessed three cyclones in last two years or two or three years flooding is a rapid onset hazard tsunamis as we witnessed in 2005 was a very major uh, coastal hazard we have witnessed on the other side we have slow onset hazards also which are shoreline erosion sea level rise salt water intrusion land subsidence this slow onset hazard take centuries and decades to show up but they are very very uh, disturbing the system of our land and as uh, we can, uh, as rudra sir was talking that how we have lost a lot of land in our uh, west bengal region due to the sea li- uh, sea level rise also uh, shoreline erosion is also causing loss of uh, the land for uh, in land in the coastal regions for us again salt water intrusion when mixes with our uh, rivers makes the water saline and it is not fit for drinking so this is also a major issue for coastal areas which we need to look into uh, moving on to the next uh, slide uh, we can see here so if coastal hazard are dangerous to us so it is very important to map these coastal hazards so the coastal hazard mapping presents a uh, present in a coastal environment in order to guide coastal planning coastal planning is very important in order to mitigate the coastal hazard and we need to develop policies uh, policies so that 
the coastal hazards could be mitigated as rudra sir was also talking about we need to do something like uh, offshore intervention or uh, plantation in the uh, in between the dikes for high tide level and proposed high tide level uh, like in extreme cyclone cases so we can see with this image this is a image by fema you can see where we have the we have various sea levels uh, shown here like this is the normal sea level this is the base flood elevation where it is proposed that the buildings or the structures near to the shoreline which lies in the uh, base flood elevation should be elevated uh, so that the water when uh, when there is a flooding in the shore area the water could pass and it could not it would not damage our property again we can see here vegetation it will stop the uh, it will it will uh, it will decrease the speed of the waves and it will reduce the intensity of the waves on the ground area so we can see uh, this zones uh, divided here where this is the very high risk zone of coastal flooding this is a immediate zone this is also a mid moderate zone and this is a safe zone in the coastal region so this is a part of coastal zonation planning which we do where we divide the area we zone the area based on the level of inundation possible in those particular areas so for those zonations coastal hazard mapping is very important so these hazard mapping involves the identification of shore lines that are potentially susceptible to the impacts of storm surge a rising sea level and erosion future sea level rise due to climate change seems likely to involve an increase in the frequency of storm surge so we can see that in last 3 years we have witnessed three major cyclones amphan was amphan yes and fani so we can see the coming days are also are going to be tougher than the current time so we need to be prepared for the for the, the for the coming uh, events in coastal areas so for that purpose coastal hazard mapping is very important so we can uh, coming to the evaluation techniques of coastal hazard we can see that there are mainly four categories for evaluating the coastal hazards the first one is the uh, methods based on dynamic computer models here we use geophysical and biological socio economic process to model the coastal hazard where we can see uh, where we use hardware and software and scientific expertise to develop the model computer models which shows the level of inundation or the level of uh, so the erosion of the shores which can be developed and presented in the form of maps which shows uh, the areas which are highly affected by the uh, hazards and this will be shown in uh, uh, later slides how it is indicated where the areas are more uh, susceptible to the hazards the next method is index indicators based methods these this method includes geo indicators basically uh, the indicators which are related to the ge ge geology of that area uh, apart from that the coastal waves the re uh, wave regions of that area we consider these factors and based on these indicators we said a broad or less uh, we we come up with a summary of formula where we come uh, we develop a map which shows the areas which are supposed to face a level of hazards which could be ranging from moderate uh, from low to moderate to higher hazard zones the third method is gis based decision support tools where we use gis for uh, mapping the hazard in the areas the next tool is visualization tools where we use simulation tools and uh, with based uh, gis based application we come up with decision support system to ease the uh, use and do not require specialized so software or hardware and this come this also this shows how uh, with like suppose this is a model where we we can input the speed of a storm uh, we could uh, we could uh, compute the uh, the height of the storm surge so this will give us a picture kind of a film kind of thing which will show what area will be inundated and affected by the storm surge in the coming time so this is a coastal hazard will system this is a technique for evaluating the coastal hazards this is a very interesting circle if you could see the there are concentric circles showing different uh, things here so the innermost circle shows the coastal classification which could be seen uh, if you if you all can see this shows the types of geology present in the shoreline which includes barrier delta uh, sedimentation coral islands so these types are these are six types of 
coastal uh, geo geological features this is a particularly this is for a uh, region named Djibouti, which is in situation situated in south africa so we can see how the wave exposure is so then uh, the, the innermost circle is showing the geological condition of that area the next circle shows the uh, here you can see the wave exposure where the areas are either exposed or either moderately exposed or protected the next circle shows the tidal range which can uh, which can be uh, seen in the color two colors where this is tidal range is moderate or higher the next circle shows the flora and fauna uh, presence in that area and after that sediment balance where we can see balance deficit or balance or surplus could be seen here after that storm climate uh, in that area is there or not it could be seen in yes or no seen here in this concentric circle after that we can see the ecosystem disruption in the next circle which is noted in one two three four five one being the lowest and four being uh, the highest after that gradual inundation in that area storm water intrusion in in those areas erosion and flooding so this is a circle showing how each coastal area of each type is facing which kind of hazard in that area and what is the size and what is the uh, what is the extent of that hazard in that area coming to the next slide so depending on the data availability uh, and accuracy requirements the uh, csw the coastal hazard v can be applied at three different assessment steps the first step is that uh, it is designed for hazard assessment where data availability and accuracy requirements are relatively low so these steps can generally be implemented based on the remote sensing in publicly available data and is useful for hazard screening and for getting an initial picture of the hazard present in cost efficient manner so a good thing about this method is it's a cost effective data uh, cost effective procedure this can be used in areas where the data is low and accuracy is low the next step is that with uh, where we have moderate accuracy this data can be used for field verification of the data obtained through remotely sensing and public data sources so this could be used also uh, in very uh, scarce uh, data uh, and very less accurate data also so and the third step is that uh, that is designed for hazard assessment with high and locally focused accuracy and this step requires systematic and detailed field assessments at local level talking about uh, Talking about the preparatory data collection needed for this method is data for geological layout, as we talked about the most inner, uh, the core circle that is for ge ge geological layout. We need to have that. The next circle was talking about the wave exposure. What was the wave exposure of that area? Again, after that, tidal in that area, data for flora and fauna is needed, which was shown in the next uh, concentric circle where we see what is the uh, if there is presence of flora and fauna in that area and what is the condition of that. Uh, flora and fauna in that area after that we need to study the sediment balance which is shown in the next concentric circle uh, where we see if that area is uh, deficit in uh, uh, sediment or it is uh, in abundance or surplus in that area or not after that we need uh, we need data for climate uh, st uh, storm climate this can be seen in this circle so this was for geological uh, data the next circle was for exposure the next was for tidal range this is for flora and fauna this is for uh, sediment balance deficit or not this is from storm climate and after this these four are for ecosystem disruption gradual inundation salt salt water inundation uh, intrusion sorry uh, uh, after that erosion and flooding so moving on to the next uh, this could be uh, this could be uh, 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 this image shows how the northern karnataka faces hazard so this uh, here we can see the green line uh, the green part showing the least affected hazard uh, the least hazard prone area in the coast uh, in the northern karnataka region whereas the red one is showing, showing the highest hazard pronity in that area so this is a map for northern karnataka on a global re uh, like uh, on a group uh, go on a global picture we can see how the coasts are facing which type of uh, level which level of hazard exposure in their area so we can see the uh, the eastern part of india especially the orissa and west bengal and bangladesh area is deep in red which indicates very high level of coastal hazard 
which was very evident with uh, uh, our previous uh, speakers also which showed uh, who sh uh, they showed how we are losing lands we are facing frequent cyclones here so this is depicted with this data also that we are facing too much of uh, coastal hazards in this area as compared to the western uh, coastal line in india the next uh, method is coastal vulnerability assessment using geo indicators so as i was talking earlier so geo indicators is a term where geological environment indicators developed as a tool to assess rapid change in environment and provide measure of ecological health so there could be uh, there are total 27 indicators which can be seen here uh, these all indicators affect somehow the uh, shoreline areas as well as the water body so based on these 27 geo indicators we develop model to study the coastal hazard in our uh, coastal regions yeah so we can see here uh, the concept of geo indicator identifies a minimum set of parameters that describes short term environmental dynamics and serve as proxies for all parameters on which process depends so we can see here the list of geo indicators and what are the uh, specifications for high risk moderate risk and low risk thing so the first point shows elevation so if the elevation of a certain uh, area is less than three meters uh, near the coast it lies in very high risk zone whereas from three to six meters it lies in moderate risk and when it is more than six meters it lies in low risk area similarly we can see the specification for vegetation shoreline parameters offshore settings erosion rate uh, beaches width slope and thickness bluff configuration dune configuration overwash engineering structures as uh, Nayak sir was also talking about that. Uh, so these indicators helps us to uh, calculate what would be the possible risk in particular area uh, near the coast. So they, these are a few more indicators where seeing uh, uh, drainage soil, other features like open water, uh, lagoons, stories. Actually what happens when uh, fresh water mixes with the saline water, we lose fresh water, which is another uh, hazard for us losing the fresh water. So these all are the indicators, major indicators for uh, preparing the hazard evaluation uh, tool for us. The next is supplementary geo indicators. Those were the main indicators. These are the geo indicators which are supplementing to those indicators in shoreline changes. So uh, the first one is severe erosion, dunes, and we can see the list of the uh, severe erosion, erosion and acceleration of long-term stability. So these all are also kept in mind while evaluating the hazard in coastal regions. Moving to the next, uh, we can see these are bluff characters. Bluff characters are they are not permanent in nature, so they are keep on changing. So you can see here slope of uh, slope angle, which with every uh, flooding situation we either lose some of the land or we get some sedimentation done at the uh, at the shoreline so this slope angle changes so we can see if over steep uh, or too steep uh, slope angle lies in high uh, high risk of failure chances and the low one lies in the low so similarly uh, we can see here that for uh, for vegetation bare empirical toppled or uh, rotated uh, vegetation lies in high risk zone whereas mature dense and undisturbed lies in the low area as uh, as we can as we know how we are losing the uh, mangrove forest in sundarban regions if it was uh, it, if it was dense if it would have been dense it would have been able to uh, withstand with the high moving wave speed and would have reduced it uh, to the maximum extent but since this uh, these are disturbed because of the climatic change so th the impact of cyclone and flooding storm surge in Sundarban areas has also increased because we have disturbed the vegetation. Um, so we can see here the all the bluff characters uh, for uh, evaluating the hazard, coastal hazards. So the next method where we use is multi-scale coastal vulnerability index. So it is a method for its application at regional, national and local. So, so it's a very good scale which, which, we, which could be used at regional, national and local scale all earlier scales were either used for local scale or either at a, at a uh, sorry to interrupt your voice is not coming kumar avenue you are on mode mute
Yeah, am I audible now? Hello. Yeah. Yes, you are audible. Is the screen visible now? No, no, no. Is it visible now? It's presenting. Yeah. Yes, it's visible so now. So the next uh, evaluation method is multi-scale coastal vulnerability index, where we can uh, see that the method or tool is suitable for its application at regional, national, and local scale. So earlier scales which were used were not too efficient for this all the three types of scale that is local, national, and regional level. Uh, so to be relevant at to the local level tool must reach the minimum. So the local level range should be one to ten square kilometer in terms of coastal areas. So the vulnerability of a coastal area can be expressed as a physical nature of the coast, the nature of perpetration or the forcing factor, and the degree to which the such changes impacts on human activities and property. So the vulnerability can be expressed as a function of coastal characteristics, resilience and susceptibility, plus coastal forcing, that is the uh, perturbation and the social economic factors, uh, which we'll discuss in later slides. So this, the three topics I talked about was the first one was the characteristics of sub-index describing the resilience, where example, uh, age of population and coastal susceptibility, landform and duration are one of the major uh, coastal characteristics. So the next is coastal forcing sub-index, which comprises of wave height, tidal range, uh, difference in storm and uh, modal wave height, storm frequency, uh, sea level rise, storms, heavy rainfall. Uh, so these are the sub-indices of the previous uh, three major ele elements, that are coastal characteristic, coastal forcing, and socioeconomic factors. So the third socioeconomic sub-index uh, comprises of land, land cover, total population in that area, cultural heritage in that area, road, rail infrastructure in that area, land use thing, conservation status of that area. So based on these indices, we develop a tool uh, which is known as multi-scale CVI. CVI is Coastal uh, Vulnerability Index Method. So the strength, strength of this uh, method of evaluation is that it integrates, it integrates uh, physical as well as social economic variables. So earlier models, we did not consider socioeconomic variables into the calculation of risk in the coastal areas. So three separated sub, sub indices representing vulnerability can be uh, very much uh, effective in terms of uh, where we are considering all the natural as well as the man-made or the socio-economic aspects for hazard uh, evaluation. So, and it is very easy calculation and not very expensive. Easily integrates the concept of risk. Yeah, so risk uh, which uh, needs exposure, vulnerability, and also comprises of coping capacity in that area. Considers that. Uh, so this this is actually this is uh, a wholesome of uh, the process where we consider all the hazard vul vulnerability and coping capacity to find the risk in coastal areas. It produces vulnerability maps, which is very easy to read and uh, for normal people also, which can be depicted in form of maps. This is applicable at both regional and local scale with same effectivity as it can go up to uh, one to 10 kilometer square area also. So the computation of such, such in, uh, sub indexes is determined on the basis of various variables whose specific identification number and typology depends on the considered application scale. So this scale, uh, each indicator is assigned a scale on one to five, where one is the lowest value and five is the highest value. So we uh, mark each variable on one to five scale. And this one to five scale allows the mathematical combination of different variables so, so that the total of the uh, total of the range comes from zero to 100 and which can be expressed in numerical value so the risk or the hazard uh, feature for our area could be depicted in a, a numerical value. So this is the formula for finding the coastal characterization sub-index. So uh, we can see here this NCC stands for number of CC variables. This is coastal characterization. So sum of CC variables minus NCC. Uh, this is a very technical uh, formula for finding the coastal characterization sub-index, which uh, can be studied here with this slide. So we can see uh, we are finding coastal characterization sub-index. We are finding coastal forcing sub-index and socioeconomic sub-index. So those three topics which I was talking here, these three indexes. Uh, so we now can find a numerical value for all these three 
elements which can be again which can be again averaged to find the coastal vulnerability index on a, in a numerical form so this this is the most beneficial part of this that we can quantify the hazard in area and we can easily compare the areas with different hazard so we can point out that this area is having higher hazard uh, chronicity than the other area and the extent of hazard in that area is also like uh, it can be said like the hazard chronicity in this area is two times that the another area so this is the benefit of this uh, method we use so we can see uh, how these subindices are, are rated on the scale of 1 to 5 so the first is coastal vulnerability variables are landform so landform we can see here the sandy shores and water plains has the highest value for 5 which is the uh, which is the maximum and hard rock shores are one this shows ki hard rock shores are very uh, are comparatively low uh, uh, low prone to the hazard coastal hazards as compared to the sandy shores and water water plains so this is because hard rocks uh, can withstand with the tidal waves the speed of the uh, speed of the waves uh, the erosion will be less in that area whereas the sandy shores they will face major erosion in the, in the in in them again elevation we can see the areas lying below 5 meters of uh, range uh, are most uh, uh, prone to the hazard coastal hazard in the coastal regions whereas the areas lying above 30 meters are very less or say almost not prone to the hazards in coastal areas in normal times unless uh, until and unless we face some major uh, cyclone events like we witnessed in last 3 years again so population over 65 is very important in terms of disaster response as well as disaster recovery phase because the older population are uh, not very physically fit to move out of the areas in case of sudden uh, sudden uh, disasters or hazard uh, cases so the area having more than 20% of their population over 65 is highly exposed to these areas and this this increases the vulner vulnerability in that area whereas the population with less than 3% of population over 65 they are very less exposed to the uh, calamities of natural disaster in that area because it will be easier for population to move out of that place if needed education level is also a very important factor because the people if the people are aware of the practices to be uh, followed while in, uh, before or during or after a, a cyclone or event like cyclone it will be uh, reflected in their behavior how they react to the incident or the hazard so uh, apart from this we had this coastal uh, reducing um, uh, coastal forcing uh, indices this includes uh, sea level rise uh, it is calculated in millimeters per year uh, so we can see the areas having the sea level rise above 3 or 2 has a score of 5 and the areas which is less than 1 uh, is having a value of 1 again storm water Uh, st storms we can see this the centimeter it is measured in centimeter so storm water height in if it is 300 if it is higher than 350 mm the score is 5 whereas the storm water height where it is below 50 cm the score to it is 1 so we can see it for different uh, indicators similarly for population growth as we were talking if area has more than 2% population growth rate this area will be more dense and will have will be highly exposed as compared to the area with population growth rate below uh, like below 1.1% so based on this the area with higher uh, population growth rate is given 5 which is more prone to hazard and whereas the area with less population growth is given point uh, one point which is uh, very less uh, prone or exposed to the hazard so again tourist arrivals is also one of the major important uh, factor because we have seen like uh, coastal areas has uh, people were uh, there was a huge loss in terms of economy as well as human life when we had this tsunami event where people were on the coastline and they couldn't uh, get out of the uh, shores on time and it resulted in huge loss of life the next one is coastal exposure where we see land cover so it is very clear from the chart that urban areas which are dense which has higher uh, population density it has 
more structures the areas are highly crowded so it will be more prone to the coastal hazard so it is given a score of 5 whereas base area bare area which is basically open land and there is only vegetation or something so this it is less affected with the uh, coastal hazard so the score is given to uh, it to is 1 again very similar fashion population density uh, is also an important thing to be uh, kept in mind while evaluating the hazard coastal hazard so population density where it is more than 250 it is given a score of 5 whereas uh, the population density uh, the area with population is less than 25 per uh, population per square kilometer is given a score of 1 this indicates that this is less prone to the hazard so again we can see that coastal vulnerability sub index can be uh, summed up like uh, as we discussed the three forms uh, three indices where we had this landform variable we had elevation variable scope of population over 65 uh, score of education level and variable so this uh, to find the coastal vulnerability sub index for that area we need to sum up the scores provided to that uh, to the each each variable in that area and using this formula we can find this coastal vulnerability which is called cv again for finding cv uh, cf we need to sum up and uh, use this formula to uh, to find the coastal forcing sub index in that area similarly in the similar fashion we need to find ce for that area and with this three uh, cv cf and ce indexes we can find the coastal risk index for that area so this this value will give us a mathematical or a quantity a quantitative value for each area and this can be uh, this can be depicted in a comparison chart that this area has higher cri and this area has lower cri as well as it can be directly compared which area needs to be focused and needs more interventions and more uh, uh, more uh, investment to be done in order to reduce the coastal hazard so this uh, this this can be seen uh, the regional risk assessment map for the Mediterranean area where we can see this uh, this line uh, which shows uh, different colors from this uh, figure we can see that the areas with the red line are the extremely highly uh, extremely high hazard pronity in these areas whereas the dot shows its uh, hot spots in these area so all these methods which we have used has helped us to mitigate the hazard and take actions beforehand or during uh, uh, during a hazard or after a hazard to make the place better i think this is uh, from my side thank you very much okay thank you uh, kumar obinoy for your wonderful lecture let's move on to the next session of uh, today's session that is question and answer session if uh, there are any questions from participants, you may feel free to ask our panelists. Is there any query? So I think no. So let me conclude the session by thanking all of you from your valuable insights and time. First, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. V. K. Nayak sir. Sir, you have touched many aspects of disaster mitigation. We are highly enlightened from your valuable lecture. Next, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Colin Rudra sir for taking time out from your busy schedule. And I would also like to thank our young scholar, Kumar Ovinoy for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. And last but not least, participants, you guys who make this program successful. And I would also like to thank our chairman, Dr. Vishwajit Roy Choudhury sir for giving such a wonderful platform to extend our knowledge. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.